Herzlich willkommen bei D18 Foto. Mein Name ist Dennis Aitchen. Heute wart ein spezieller Gast auf uns fürs Interview, nämlich Nate Matos. Ich kenne Nate schon relativ lange, er kennt mich gar nicht. Das Ganze kommt so zustande, dass ich mit diesen Dingern hier ständig unterwegs bin. Das sind meine Ohrstöpsel, mit denen ich seinem Podcast folge, wenn ich beim Laufen bin, wenn ich, wenn ich spazieren gehe, wenn ich mit dem Hund draußen bin. Da ist Nate ganz häufig dabei mit seinen beiden Kollegen Simon Ponder und Tony Gale. Die betreiben nämlich den Podcast PD Exposures und das ist eine wunderbare Geschichte, wenn man sich mit Thema analoge Fotografie beschäftigen möchte. Viele coole Sprüche, markige Meinungen und vor allen Dingen ganz, ganz viel Ahnung. All das machen die dabei im Kanal. Und der Grund, warum wir uns heute mit Nate treffen, ist aber nicht PD Exposures, sondern sein neuer YouTube-Kanal, den er gestartet hat und vor allem sein Buchprojekt Seraph and Silver. Das ist sehr spannend, was das alles ist, soll man selber sagen. Und damit wir das machen können, muss ich jetzt erstmal hier reinklettern in mein kleines Ministudio. Das Ganze ist hier ein bisschen kompliziert, weil ich muss um diese Lampe drumherum tanzen. Das ist nicht so ganz einfach, aber wir kriegen das hier alles hin. So, und damit das Ganze funktionieren kann, müssen wir auf Englisch rüberschalten, denn sonst funktioniert das nicht, denn der Kollege spricht natürlich Englisch. So, es ist, äh, ja, ich sehe ihn schon auf dem Monitor, es kann losgehen. Welcome to the 18 Photo, my name is Dennis 18. Welcome Nate Matos. You guys know him from PD Exposures, his own YouTube channel, and of course, Seraph and Silver, wonderful book project. And what all that is about, let's ask him himself, this, ladies and gentlemen, is Nate Matos. Hi, Nate. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, how about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing absolutely fine. This to you. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you like the mug. This is one of the little traditions we have here at, at uh, the 18 Photo. I usually have mugs for most of my guests. Sometimes oh. they send their own mugs to me. And this is one I actually had to make myself. Make myself because <laughs> I, would, I don't have I Nate mug. One. I, I don't drink coffee, though. So I don't, like, I don't have any mugs to share, unfortunately. There's some water in here because I don't oh, really know well, what, what we're drinking today. <laughs> it's noon time in America. I have no idea what you guys drink at noon. <laughs> Soda, probably. Okay, so no whiskey today. <laughs> no, not today. <laughs> okay. Um, let me get, get everybody started before I, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself. The way I know you is from PD Exposures. You have been walk, running around, jogging and walking around with, with my earplugs in, listening to your voice. So I have a feeling that I actually know you, but you have never seen me before and I've never seen <laughs> you in person. So this is a really cool experience. Thank you very much for joining D18 Photo oh, yeah. today. And, uh, let's, let's get started with, first of all, who are you? <laughs> and uh, then let's maybe jump into to a quick detour around uh, PD Exposures and then we move on to your current projects. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for anyone who's watching and is not aware, my name is Nate Mattis. Um, I've, I'm 28 years old, I'm a few weeks from 29, so that's just around the corner. Um, and I've been, uh, I've been shooting photography uh, ever since uh, junior year of high school, so 11 years now, coming up on 12. Um, and it was, you know, when, when I took the kind of high school photography class, it was at this weird time. It was in the early, mid-2000s, and... Um, Digital SLRs were, were a thing, but um, but they really weren't affordable enough or commonplace enough. So we were we were really on the the tail end of um, using film in the in the darkroom within high school. And so that's what that was my introduction to film. Um, and then I you know graduated high school, left and uh, got a digital camera. Shot with that for a number of years, and then on a whim I bought a Canon AE1 just because I wanted to play around with it. And from there it, it, it spiraled and I've been shooting film exclusively for the last uh, half a decade now. Um, I do it in both personal and uh, professional work uh, when, it, when it comes up. Um, professional work, not, not as much, but that's okay. Uh, and, and yeah, I've just, I've just been really enjoying it. And, um, and I, like, I like talking about it. I like talking about the process. I like sharing my work in any number of different formats and, uh, and really exploring a lot of the, uh, a lot of the ideals behind photography and what it means to both photographers and to um, viewers and consumers of photography as an art form. Okay, cool. Um, how, before, before we get into PD exposures, what's your favorite camera? Which, what, what's on your desk right now? Um, so it, it depends. Uh, For, for 35 millimeter, I have a Leica M6. Uh, for medium format, I have two different cameras. I have a Pentax 67.2 and a Fuji GA645. So I kind of have a more serious medium format and a kind of point and shoot medium format. And then large format, I have a Toyo uh, 45CX, which I, which I don't use as often as I would like, but, uh, but I keep it around just in case. And you, do you also develop your own film and do your own prints? Yeah, uh, so actually my kitchen's right behind me. I develop all of my own film in there. Um, black and white, I should say. Color, for me, it's, it's still just easier. Portland, uh, Portland, Oregon, that is, 
has a lot of great photo labs. Uh, we have Citizens Photo, we have Blue Moon Camera, we have Profoto Supply, um, and then they're they're actually just even as of a few years ago, there used to be quite a few more. Um, I think we were up to like eight small independently owned camera stores um, within like a 15 minute drive of my home uh, for, for quite a while. And just recently, a few of them have started to close down, which is unfortunate. Um, but that's, that being said, uh, yeah, to answer your question, I do all of my own black and white uh, film developing here. Um, as for prints, I had a dark room at my old home. I still have all the equipment for it. And I actually, I have a basement here that I just haven't gotten around to uh, to setting up the dark room again just because um, there's no way to get ventilation in there without exposing it to light. And so I'd, I'd rather not poison myself at this point. <laughs> Maybe do that later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The whole poisoning thing. <laughs> let, let me introduce you to one of my favorite cameras, which... <laughs> <laughs> the best thing about this thing is that it actually smiles at you. <laughs> it's not my main shooter, but I just love having this thing around to run, walk around with this thing. And if you're on a playground and got it around your neck and yeah. you fall down and you don't strangle yourself because this thing has got a panic lock, <laughs> which is really cool. <laughs> but uh, just, um, you know, the whole smiley thing is basically the main feature of this thing. <laughs> that's good i like that none of my cameras do that so, yeah, so you, who needs a leica right yeah <laughs> well i do but uh, i would love to have one so if you would like to trade I'll tell yeah. you <laughs> takes 35 millimeters <laughs> all right that's let's move on to pd exposures uh, that's how i know you what was that project about and when did it start so yeah so i've always been um I've always been really project focused. Uh, before I really got into photography, um, you know, I, I, I played around and started a lot of my own things. Um, so you, years ago, um, I, I had a small online magazine with a with a good friend of mine, and we we did all of the writing and uh, and photography for it. And it was all um, automotive culture and like uh, import cars in the Pacific Northwest, so Portland and kind of in Seattle, and then Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, and Canada. Um, and we we would do like. Uh, photo shoots of cars and write-ups and cover like events and stuff like that. Um, and so as, as that was really my, how photography kind of became a bigger part of my life um, because I was really into cars and, you know, every weekend we were, we were wrenching and, and, you know, modifying and racing and doing all this stuff. Um, and so I, I just, I started bringing my camera around to all that and I would take photos of the cars there and that, that spawned that online magazine um, but then as, as I started taking photos of other things, um, I realized that uh, photography was, was much more satisfying to me um, in terms of kind of at that point a hobby. And so I, um, I, I kind of decided uh, that I, I was, you know, in, in high school I thought I wanted to go into like advertising. Um, and, you know, that, that's really, that was the career path that I saw for myself. And... So within that, I, I became really obsessed with branding. And uh, so when I started to like take my own photos and, and do my own thing that way, I would uh, I wanted it to be a brand instead of just you know Nate Mattis photography, um, which a lot of other people I knew were doing. And so I, I came up with this name of PD Exposures. And, and Port, for those who don't know, the city I live in Portland, um, it's also known as PDX. And so it was a really easy transition: PDX Exposures, PD Exposures. And so for a long time, uh, that, that really just sat as, uh, as kind of my, my domain and my portfolio. Uh, and I did a little bit of professional work there, but not a whole bunch. And so then, um, then one day I, I was you know, on a forum and um, I saw someone say, like, I, I, would really, I haven't been able to find, but I'd really love to see a YouTube video that goes over like, kind of the basics of large format photography. And I've been thinking about starting a YouTube channel for a while, so I said, okay, well, maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe I can start here. And so I, I, I pulled up the only webcam I had which was the really, really crappy one that was attached to my old MacBook. Um, it's absolutely horrible. And if you watch like the very, the earliest two or three videos on my, uh, on the Pete Exposure YouTube channel, the quality is just atrocious. Um, but, but, but I started there and then I kept making videos and kind of gained this following. And then I was talking to, uh, to Tony um, and he had been wanting to do a podcast and I had been wanting to do kind of a podcast. And we had talked to a couple of other people in the community um, about trying to get someone else to host it, like kind of under their name. And no, nobody really wanted to do it. So we said, okay, well, we'll do it ourselves. And it was really at that point where I kind of started envisioning this bigger thing for PD Exposures. And so the PD Exposures YouTube channel 
And then we, we had the Peak Exposures podcast to kind of coincide with it. And, and then those just kind of kept growing. And we, you know, we added new, new podcasts and we did the Peak Exposures TV for a while. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of how that all, that all came to be. It was really just kind of one inadvertent, you know, next step after another. Um, none of it, <laughs> I, I never planned for any of it to go that way. I never planned for it to kind of become this big thing. Um, it was always just kind of supposed to be this, this little personal, my little personal section of the internet. And that's why I had such a weird name, uh, PD Exposures. Not a lot of people understood it or, uh, pronounced it properly or anything. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of where it came from. Cool. How, how long have you been actually doing that, that project? It's last thing I've heard was, um, end of last year, is that it? Yeah, I, I believe that's about right. So that that went on for about five, four, four years, I would say, uh, from about 2011 to 2015. Cool. Um, yeah, quite a long project then. Yeah, it was good. It was uh, it was really great for me. Um, it while while a lot of what we talked about was uh, was cameras specifically, um, it really provided a great uh, great foray into um, other aspects of, of kind of photography and everything that goes along with that. Um, and so, so some of the, some of my favorite episodes of the podcast we did were the ones where we actually discussed uh, photography as an art form and really got more into uh, those types of discussions rather than just talking about the cameras themselves. Yeah, what, what we do here at the Eighteen Photo, well, I say we, it's me. <laughs> what I do here at the Eighteen Photo, um, basically the whole idea is uh, that it's not about the cameras; it's about um, the ideas and the way to express yourself via the medium of photography. In, in an interview with a friend of mine, just which I recorded this morning, I said, I don't really care much about photography. Uh, it's just the kind of art form that I think I can handle. That's that's the, the brush I know how to use. <laughs> if, if I could paint, I would probably paint. It's, it's, it's all about the creative expression and photography happens to be the one thing which I'm supposedly good at. Everybody, everything else sucks. So... <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, let, let's move on to your YouTube channel. You started off as a YouTube uh, under that uh, PD Exposures brand at, on YouTube, and now you've got your own channel. Where do we find yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was um, it, it was something that I, I thought about a lot when we were doing PD Exposures. Um, you know, for, for for so many years, it was it was branded as this other thing, and uh, as PD Exposures grew and, <laughs> and as I grew as a photographer, I wanted to kind of do a better job of. of staking my claim and putting my name on things. And so that's, that's really where this, this new kind of YouTube channel started. And, I, and as far as consistency, it's, I don't update it super often. I think there's only like six or seven videos up there now. Um, and so it's, whereas Pete Exposures was, was kind of a, like, let's get a camera in, let's talk about it really fast, get rid of it and on to the next one. Um, this one, this, this YouTube channel that, that I, I'm working on now, um, and recording some videos for, it's, it's pretty basic and it, it's, um, I want to talk more about the, the cameras that I use on a regular basis, cameras that I'm, I'm really well versed in. And then also, uh, just as another method to discuss my personal projects, um, I, I, I when I write and as I'm sure you've noticed when I talk, I, I tend to kind of ramble on. Um, and so it's. So for, for me, sometimes when I'm trying to discuss a certain project that I'm working on, it's it's easiest for me to just kind of talk out loud, and and I'll even um, I'll even just set up a like a tape recorder, a voice recorder on the table, and just start talking to myself and re record for an hour and a half, two hours, mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of spill all the ideas out that I can. Because if I try and write everything down, you know, on the keyboard, it just it doesn't flow as well for me. So so speaking and talking like this is is really the, the medium that I'm most comfortable at, and that I I feel that I get the uh, I, I'm able to, you know, discuss my ideas in, in the most accurate way as possible, um, and so so that's really where where this uh, where this YouTube channel is coming from. Less less so much about just you know buy the books gear reviews, um, and more about uh, you know a, a I guess a podium for me to speak my mind about kind of what's going on in my world. So cool because there's so many gear review channels. Whenever you type in photography. Yeah. It's always the latest Nikon, uh, Canon, Fuji, or whatever. No, no brand loyalties here, no sponsoring. <laughs> if somebody wants to sponsor me, though, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be happy. Um, but uh, people actually talking about the craft and the art of photography, I think, is something which is really missing out there. Besides a, f a few big names like like Ted Forbes, for example, who's, who's mm -hmm. really probably the gold standard of, of talking about the art of photography. And, uh, but otherwise, there are very few people actually doing that. And I'm glad to, to have found you out there. And 
and hopefully we're doing the same thing here. Um, let's let's move on to one of your videos I saw, which really surprised me. I thought it was really cool and gutsy to do. Was um, I'm not talking about the one where you shoot the camera. That's that's an old one where you actually fire <laughs> a gun at a camera, which was hilarious. But that's not the one I meant. The, one of the last videos you did was you actually did a review on notebooks, on mm -hmm. paper notebooks, which yeah. I thought was really cool. I'm trying to find that on the photography channel. How did that all happen? Well, so I'm a, I love I love notebooks. I have a whole bunch. Of, I mean, I'm sitting at my kitchen table and there's one right here. Um, and so I actually, these, these are what I carry around is our field notes, um, and I carry them all over the place. And I have uh, I think I have like six or seven at any given time that I'm I'm continuously writing in. Um, and I used to carry around bigger moleskins, you know, bigger things. And, and what I found was that it was too hard for me to keep everything in order. Um, so now I, I have, you know, a whole bunch of these at any given time and each one is a very specific subset. So I have one for photography. I have one for projects around the house. I have this one, which is just random notes. Um, and it's great cause you know, it allows me to do fun things. Like I, I, I like to put pockets in the back of them so that I can keep random papers and stuff that I find. Um, and so I, I love notebooks and, and the idea behind notebooks I, I think is great. And I think it, um, it, it coincides really, really well with, uh, with photography and film photography. I, I think it's such a, it's a tactile experience, which is, is missing in so, so much work these days. You know, there are 10,000 apps out there that will tie into your camera and be able to log all of your exit data and make all of those notes for you. But Looking, looking more as, as photography as an art form, it's, there, there are so many components that, that start to disappear as we move to a much more automated process. Mm -hmm. So with digital cameras, you, 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 know, you snap the photo and it's all recorded and then it moves onto your computer and then you post it online to Flickr, wherever you post it. And, and for, for many photographers, that's it. it it's, it's an art form that lives in an entirely digital realm. And there, there are other art forms that, that do that as well. Um, there's you know, digital painting, for example. Uh, but but in, in a much similar way to photography, it, it, it never got that digital um, prefix added to it. Yeah. Um, and so, so you'll see like people just share something online and they go, look at this thing I painted. And it's, well, you didn't, you didn't paint it because there was no paint involved. Uh, you, 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 know, you move pixels around it. And that's, that's not to discredit the, the talent and skill that goes into doing something like that because I totally get I could never do it in a million years. Mm. Um, and photography, it, it becomes a little bit more ambiguous because, you know, photography is to paint with light. And so regardless of whatever your capturing medium is, digital photography is still doing that. But when, when we look at the history of photography and how it ties into all these other art forms and how it was both praised and um, kind of tried to be taken down a notch by the fine art community, you know, in terms of the skill that was involved – it took, it took photographers many, many decades to really get photography to a point where they could justify it as an art form to the greater art community. And, I mean, to, to be blunt, I feel like digital photography, because of its accessibility and because of how easy it is to manipulate, um, you know, it still takes a long time to, to master certain portions of it. But the, the photos that anyone can take after buying a, uh, a digital camera, you know, off of Amazon and going out and snapping your photos – and with a very basic understanding of Photoshop, they're, they're absolutely amazing photos. You, you need no, to look no further than some of the stuff that's, that's taken with your phone yeah. and posted on Instagram to, to see that. Yeah. Um, and so, so for me, it's, it's, really, um, it's really about getting, getting that, all of that experience back um, and, and notebooks really help. So the, the, the notebook that you're referring to it was, uh, it was a Kickstarter project that I backed a while ago. Um, and I, I had some other notebooks like it. I had the analog book series, which it just allows you to take quick notes. Um, and it's formatted really well for exposure and any other mm. things that are specifically tailored to photography. And so I saw this and I figured I would give it a shot as it was going to be like an, another version of that. And it just, it wasn't very good. The paper wasn't, I mean, I have so many notebooks that, that and I, I have experience with all of these things. That's like, the paper was like copy paper. Uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff in there that wasn't needed. Like, there, who needs a table of contents in a notebook? I don't need a history about notebooks in a notebook. I just want blank pages where I can write on. You yeah. know? <laughs> and uh, you just you told me that you 
uh, kind of do rough drafts of your projects while speaking to to your voice recorder or to use your your notebooks. Um, one of the projects I stumbled across was Seraph and Silver, which really impressed me because you've been doing that for a while now. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm following you on Instagram and, and, and see that on, on your pictures on Twitter, what, whatever you do there, which is really cool. And uh, from what I gather, you have your own website for that project, right? Mm -hmm. where, where do people go to, to check out what we're talking about right now? Yeah, so it's just, it's seraphandsilver.com. Okay. Um, and in the, because that project is kind of winding down, in the in the next couple of months, that will inevitably that as a solo website will go away, and it'll just it'll forward to uh, to a spot on my personal website, which is named Mattis.com. But for now, you can still check it out at SarahFinsilver.com. Okay. Can you tell us what what uh, that project is all about? Yeah. So um, so it kind of came from two different perspectives. Um, there there have been a lot of um, I, you know I, as I'm sure a lot of photographers do. I have boxes of prints upstairs in our studio. Sure. And um, over, over time, uh, you know, I'll, every so often I'll, I'll pull out the box and I'll kind of flip through it and I'll organize it a little bit. And I'll go, oh, these photos kind of look good together. And I'll, or there's like 10 photos here that are kind of, there's something that's working on there. And that, that's just how I work. It's how I put stuff together. Um, and so I, I had had one of these boxes that was all just Polaroids for, for a really long time. Um, and I had wanted to do something with them. And so uh, I started working and I was trying to figure out how I wanted to present it. And I, I, I knew that I wanted to do a publication because I'm a big fan of, uh, I, I honestly feel that, that as, as an artistic medium, photography should only be looked at printed. I, I, I mean, digitally, yes, I'll share stuff on Instagram and online, but, but the, you know, the ultimate way to look at it is in person, um, whether that be in a, in a book or magazine or anything. Um, but it's like, you know, you, you don't get the same experience looking at the Mona Lisa as if you just look at a JPEG of it on the internet. You know, you, have to, you want to be there. You want to be intimate with it. Uh, so, so I, I knew that I wanted to print it, and I started kind of putting stuff together. And at the same time, I, I realized that, for, from from my view anyway, I, I felt that I I was getting better at being able to put series together and start working with with photographs um, in, in telling larger stories. Um, and so, I wanted to to kind of work on other aspects of what goes into what goes into photography and what goes into a series and, and use it as a platform to discuss how I envision uh, photography going in the next, you know, 20 years, 100 years, whatever. So I, I kind of put it together and I started writing about the, my thought process and the, the actual process that was going into putting this into a book or a magazine. And, um, and so, yeah, so I just, I just started writing and, That's, that's kind of how the first issue came to be. So the title, Seraph and Silver, Seraph being the, the essay that goes at the beginning of each issue and Silver being that they're all film photographs. Uh, so Silver, Halide, Silver Gels and that sort of thing. And that, that's, that's kind of how that comes together. And then it was published every quarter. Um, so it's a quarter film photography, quarterly film photography journal. The first one you did was the Polaroids, right? Mm -hmm. it, um, yes. How, how, was, how was your connection to Polaroids? And how is how's that as a connection or yeah how, how do you feel about polaroids especially um i mean i got this wonderful thing right here which is slowly dying because i just got two more <laughs> packs of of uh, fuji film and uh, i got all this these boxes of uh, the possible project lying around but it's not really polaroid is it i mean no no it's not um the the impossible project it's it's its own thing um you know i was My, my life and how I kind of fit into photography is I was, I have a whole bunch of Polaroids from when I was a child because, you know, it was, it was what we would take on family vacations. Yeah. Um, and it was, that, that was always a lot of fun. Um, and even as a kid, I remember being excited about watching the photo develop. Um, but then as, as I started taking photography more seriously, I, I was just, just a year or so too late to really be able to buy a whole bunch of actual Polaroid film. Um, so I kind of came into it as, as the Impossible Project really started taking off and, and put, they put out their first film and, uh, you know, I bought some of that. Um, so, yeah, so Pol Polaroid as a medium, I, I, I really enjoy it as I, I found that it, it's, it's not as much uh, for me um, as, it, as it used to be. Uh, and part of that is because of the cost. Uh, part of that is because of the inconsistent results. Um, I, I, I really like to know what I'm getting when I take the photo 
And uh, unfortunately, the Impossible Project doesn't always provide that. Polaroid did, which is great, um, but the Impossible Project—they're not—they're not quite there. And I'm sure they will get there one day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Fuji, obviously, you know, I've—I've I've been frustrated with Fuji for a long time with how how readily they're killing off films, and that's a whole—that's a whole other discussion that I could get into. Um, but but yeah, so so I haven't really shot a whole bunch of Polaroid. I, I have one pack of the latest Impossible Project stuff in my fridge, and. I, I usually buy a pack or two whenever they put something new out. But other than that, I haven't been shooting a whole bunch of it. Hmm. So what's, what's the, uh, the future of film? Is, is there, will there be one or are we, are we stuck with the rest and slowly dwindling off? No, I, there, there's, there's always going to be something. I've always looked at it like, um, like cars. Uh, I feel like it's going to be very similar to, to kind of the timeline of that. You know, as, as, as we move, um, as we move automobiles, you know, more towards alternative fuels, hydrogen, electric, whatever, th- there will eventually become a point where, uh, where that's, that's what the bulk of people are driving. You know, it'll be an inverse of what it is today where only a select few are driving electric cars. Um, but what does that mean for everyone with their classic, you know, 1966 Ford Mustang? Because those people aren't going to want to give them up. So, so what will happen is you'll have boutique companies that are manufacturing gasoline on a, on a smaller scale. And, you know, there will either be a delivery service where you have a small tank in your house so that you can still go out and drive your classic car whenever you want to. Now, the gas will probably be 20 to $30 a gallon because it'll be boutique. Um, but, but you will always, you'll always be able to buy gasoline. I I don't forever see gasoline going away entirely. Um, and and film, I kind of see going, going the same route. Um, you know, you know, companies like the bigger companies like Fuji and Kodak, they will eventually stop making film altogether. Um, I, I think everybody, um, everybody pretty much understands that and kind of expects it to come. The question is when. Fuji, I think, will go out much sooner than Kodak. I, I see Kodak being around in the next decade. Fuji, I'm not entirely sure about. Um, and so Ilf- Ilford, I believe, will stick around into perpetuity. Um, their, their, you know, their business has always been as kind of a smaller tier, black and white only uh, film producer. And so that's what we're going to see. We're going to see a lot of these smaller companies that are doing it on, on a much more boutique level. So you look at, uh, film for Anya, for example, you know, th- their way to circumvent that was to produce or is in, once they get to that point will be to produce film using uh, smaller machines because the, the master roll machines that both Kodak and uh, Fuji have are just so enormous that it's it's not cost effective for them to spend the money to produce this master roll and then not see a return on their investment for the next five years. Yeah. But with a company like Ferrania, who can do it in much smaller batches, they'll be able to see a profit on producing that master roll in six months to a year. And so you'll have companies that, you know, Kodak and Fuji, they both made these wide gamuts of films, color negative, color positive, black and white, you know, sheet film, all sorts of things. I don't, I don't think you'll see that as much anymore. What you'll see instead is like Ilford only does black and white, Ferrania only does color slide, and that, that sort of thing I believe will happen. Mm. And so you'll inevitably, we'll probably be paying more for film um, on an exposure by exposure basis, uh, but, but I don't think it'll ever go away entirely. I think it will always exist as an, an artistic medium. And at the, at the end of the day, you have things like, um, you know, Galaxy did, did their, uh, their photo paper, and it's like, producing a gelatinous liquid emulsion actually isn't that hard. You just have to buy the chemicals for it, which you can do pretty easily. Um, and then, you know, you mix it up and you coat some paper and you let it dry and it's, Hey, you have your own four by five sheet film that you made in a day. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, to answer your question as an art form, I think film and, um, emulsion based image making will always be around. Mm. To wrap the subject up, what, why film? <laughs> for me? Yeah. What, 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 what does it, I mean, I can answer it myself. I actually wrote a little book about it, shameless plug here, but um, why do you shoot film? What, what's it for you? Um, so, so that answer has evolved um, over the years, but, it, but it's always kind of kept the same thread. Uh, so for, for me, um, I think a, a lot of people say, you know, it's, it's the color rendition or they like using the older cameras or any number of things. Um, but for me, it's always been the tangibility of it. So I, I, I always say, and I always tell people that if I was left unchecked, I would be a disgusting hoarder. Like I, you know, I'd have newspapers up to my eyeballs and there would just be shit everywhere in my house. Um, but luckily I have a outstanding girlfriend who, who kind of keeps me in line. Um, 
But that, that being said, when it, when it comes to collecting and when it comes to um, archiving, that, that's what does it for me. And I, at the end of the day, I like knowing that I've produced an object that holds space and holds value in this world. So you, you can look at it like if you go to an antique store, you know, a lot of times you'll find those, those buckets of just old photos, photos and they'll be 25, 50, whatever, how much they are. Um, and so no, no matter what you do with, with photos, the, in theory, there will probably always be a market for someone who's, who applies some amount of value to even that, you know, that 35 millimeter single frame. If I were to cut up a whole bunch of those, I'm sure I could sell them for, you know, a nickel a piece at a flea market or something. So, so there's always value there. Um, the same can be said about digital files. So, so say what you want about, you know, the archivability or, or whatever, but you're, I don't, I don't feel like anything's actually being created when you, when you take a digital photo and, unless you print it. And so few photographers actually do print their digital files. Yeah. And so from my perspective, I know that every time I take a photo, every time I finish a roll, every time I develop, every time I put it into the sleeves, I'm, I'm, not, only, I'm not only creating something and bringing something into this world, but I'm saving it and it has a place within my home and within my personal space um, that, that I can look at and say, yes, I, I accomplished this. I did this. Uh, and that, that's really where a lot of my drive to shoot, to shoot film comes from. Hmm. I was at a, at a flea market two weeks ago and I did a blog, blog there running around having a good time filming place and then I came across this box with a bunch, a bunch of crap in it just from, from some weird place and in the middle of the, all that crap was a framed picture of, of, of a wedding day a wedding couple standing there she in a white dress he in his best suit and the whole box was labeled one euro for every piece and that was the moment where I actually stopped having fun I just I, I looked at that thing and said, somebody's wedding picture is in this box with the, with the price tag on it saying one euro a piece. It was so weird. It got me thinking about the importance of pictures in your life and um, how much it actually is worth to, to some people and to others it's totally worthless. And it's, it was, mm -hmm. was really something that stuck with me since, since that moment. And uh, it was really weird to, to find something like that. It's, I don't know. Oh yeah, yeah. It's you know there there was that um, I'm not sure if you saw it, but um, the New York Times just did a video on a, on a, one of the reporters found a whole bag like a, a giant you know 30 gallon black garbage bag of slides on the street corner in New York City, and so there's this whole piece about finding out more about the photographer and and her friends and family she had since passed on. But yeah, it's. You know, some, some people attribute a whole bunch of value to, uh, to it and others it's, it's literally trash, you know? It, um, so yeah, but I think provided the opportunity there, there's always something there that is, it's an object. It, 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 it can be sold, you know, that's it's capitalism, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Bad capitalism. Just one euro for wedding. <laughs> charge more for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, Nate, we're coming up at about on 40 minute mark now. Thank you so much for spending time with, with us. And uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and, and uh, wish you all the best. Say hi to Portland. Hope the weather's <laughs> fine. From what I've heard, <laughs> it's, it's a quite rainy place, but beautiful place. Yeah, we're, it's, it's the middle of July and it's, you know, 70 degrees and cloudy right now. So okay. it's pretty typical Portland summer. <laughs> okay. The other side of my, this mug actually is from Hamburg. Where I come from, and it's basically the same problem. We have also closer to the seaside and had <laughs> a lot of uh, bad weather. But there's no bad weather, just bad clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nate, it was so good talking to you. So, hope you have a good time back there, and uh, see you later, hopefully. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And keep shooting. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.